Has anybody here ever done the edge walk on the CN Tower? My palms are sweating just thinking about the notion. I'll tell you, as I was thinking through this illustration and, and, and making some notes about it, my palms were sweating just typing because heights are not my thing. Uh, it's this daring opportunity to place your life in the hands of a steel rope uh, while you lean back into thin air <laughs> uh, above the observation deck of Canada's tallest freestanding structure. And get this, you actually have to pay to do this. Nobody could pay me enough to do it, but if anybody wants to be a daredevil, they can pay part of their hard-earned money <laughs> and they can try this. Many thrill seekers subject themselves to the whims of adrenaline and test the laws of physics each year by uh, placing all their weight on these steel cables and hooks and harnesses with nothing but air and gravity and hard concrete a long way down, a long, long way down. I've never seen the waiver that people have to sign for this but I'm guessing it's been vetted, re-vetted, and vetted yet again by any number of lawyers to make sure that if something goes wrong, the CN Tower will be left squeaky clean. In an activity like the Edge Walk, there has to be some room for error. Even if the cables never break, even if the harnesses are properly put on, people are still people, and the possibility of injury or death is always there. So you pay your money, you sign a piece of paper that's heavily worded that says if anything goes wrong, it's your fault. You suit up, you hook up, and you go test your nerves in the laws of science. But when you're out on that ledge... Those steel cables, those hooks, those harnesses, the leaders that you follow, and your fellow daredevils, you are putting your hope in their reliability. This morning I want us to think about something similar, something though that might not make your palms sweat quite so much. I want us to think about what it means to have hope in a world that at times can seem pretty hopeless. There's a lot of variables in a statement like that, not least our own mental health. If we're exercising regularly, reading widely, getting plenty of sunshine, living in relationship with God, and don't find ourselves too susceptible to mental illness, uh, there's a reasonable probability that we will be less likely to see the world as a hopeless place. But even those factors are causing some people to question in these COVID times the degree of hopelessness in which we live. Inspired by Andy Stanley, we've been talking about how times are uncertain, but God is not. How important it is to rejoice in the Lord always, even in the midst of trial. And today, I want us to think about hope. Hope is a person or a thing on which our expectations are centered, in which we place our confidence as relates to our future. By contrast, hopelessness refers to the feeling we get when we believe that what we've placed our trust in is not going to come through. That's why I get sweaty palms thinking about walking around the top of the CN Tower. The cable might be okay, the person in charge might be competent, but I'm not sure I trust myself. We place our hope in something from the time we are born. Usually in healthy situations, that's our parents. But here's an analogy Andy Stanley uses. He says that hope is like a ladder that we place against a wall. We trust it to support our dreams, our future, our security. Uh, Tuesday night, I sort of said I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I'm going to anyway. On Tuesday night, the... Uh, Session had a little bit of extra time in its agenda. And so somebody said, do you think we could maybe do something about the space in the curtain around the cross? And I said, well, I've tried different times, but really the best effort you're going to get is to get the 20-foot ladder out and lean it up against that. So, but, but 
probably more for entertainment purposes than anything else, I took the modified broomstick that's back there that uh, was for bringing down the manual screen that hides behind there that we never use anymore, and I, I, tr- I stood on the back pew and, and, and I held on to the cross for, for, for leverage, you know, probably a good idea for a preacher to cling to the old rugged cross, right? And, uh, and I tried to manipulate that curtain, but with no success, particularly, as those of you who are here can see. I, I'm not a fan of heights, so the only way that's going to get fixed is going to be to go up the ladder, and that is going to be done by someone else. I remember as a child being invited by my dad to climb up the ladder to the flat part of the roof of our home that had a a doorway to the attic. As a kid, climbing up the ladder was kind of fun. But then the reality that I had to climb back down by putting my back to the ladder and and putting my foot out in midair in the hope that it was going to land on that rung, that was never fun. And since that time, though I never fell, I have never been a fan of heights. Maybe you've seen some pictures that give evidence of why women live longer than men. You ever seen something like that where... Some t- somehow a ladder is propped up precariously in some way in order for a chap to be able to get a job done. Well, Andy Stanley says that the older we get, the more inclined we are to lean our ladders against those things or people that promise financial or emotional security. We want to maintain hope in a hopelessly broken world, a world that will still have restrictions at Christmas time. So where will we lean our ladder? Time and again the Bible calls us to place our hope in God and as we await the birth of God's one and only Son we live in hope. But rather than read a story about the coming of Jesus, we're going to hear plenty of those through Advent, we're going to hear those on Christmas, I want to reach further back into the Scriptures to a passage that Jesus, I'm sure, would have memorized himself in his lifetime, a passage that affirms our hope in God. Christine read Psalm 32 for us, and in the final verse, that proclaims, So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey Him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. And Psalm 33 is actually the answer to Psalm 32. And it's what we're going to focus on this morning. Psalm 33. Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise Him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre and make music for Him on the ten-stringed harp. Now, that the, the picture that you might envision of that verse is um, perhaps like a a medieval king's court or something like that where people are being fed grapes and somebody is quietly playing on the ten-stringed lyre or ten-stringed harp and the lyre or whatever. It, but in fact, in Hebrew culture, that kind of picture was quite a bit more raucous. It was a, uh, a form of direct praise in response to the call of Psalm 32, a very joyous, noisy kind of picture that is painted there in the original. Verse 3, sing a new song of praise to him, play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. Now one Old Testament scholar says this is rarely found in religious music. I think he maybe overstates that. But it emphasizes the importance of being in tune and on key and offering our best in praise to God. For the word of the Lord holds true or level or straight, and we can trust everything He does. He loves whatever is just and good. The unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. Unfailing love. We're about to go back into lockdown. You remember when we were about to go back into lockdown last time? Nobody wants to remember that, but we were 
in the book of Ruth. Unfailing love. That's that Hebrew word I taught you back in those times. The word, and try not to spit when you say this because coronavirus. Chesed. Remember that? Chesed? That's the word that's used here in Psalm 33. Unfailing love, covenant faithfulness. These are verses that speak of the character of God. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. Here's God's creativity at work. He assigned the seas and its boundaries. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. God made the oceans in the same way that we might take a sealer jar and fill it with water. God set the boundaries. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes. I'm reminded of Proverbs 19.21 here that says, You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Or Romans 8, which we looked at not that long ago, that says all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. But the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. There's a Jewish translation of this verse that says, What the Lord plans endures forever, what He designs for ages on end. I like that. Ages on end. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people He has chosen as His inheritance. Now, this inheritance typically refers to property uh, possessed by a family in perpetuity, which is why land is such a big deal in Uh, Jewish culture. Verse 13, the Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts so he understands everything they do. The best equipped army cannot save a king nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory for all its strength It cannot save you. Stories in Joshua and Judges remind us of this reality. Then stories in the books of Kings remind us of the futility of relying on sheer strength and numbers. Self-reliance is futile. But the Lord watches over those who fear Him, those who rely, those who patiently wait on His unfailing love. There's that, what was that word again? Chesed, right, his covenant faithfulness. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield, that is, our protector in trouble. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. The only way we can have hope in a broken world is to place our hope in God alone. So what does that look like for the psalmist? What does that look like for us? How can we place our hope in God? Well, a few suggestions. First is by worshiping Him for who He is. The first three verses of Psalm 33 call us to sing for joy to the Lord, to praise Him with melodies on instruments, to sing a new song to the Lord. When we find ourselves in a hopeless place, when things just don't feel like they are going to right, we can going to be right. We can turn from our focus on those things and instead focus on praising the Lord. You don't need a special building to do it. You can do it anytime, anywhere. Because the Lord, don't miss this, the Lord is as close as the mention of His name. If you find yourself without words, you know, you've been focusing on something hopeless, you want to focus on the Lord, you don't have any words, here's a few options for how to do that. One is to just simply sit in His presence without words, silence. 
We often don't give God enough time in silence to actually speak into our lives. Another is to use the words of Scripture to praise the Lord. We can uh, take a, a psalm, for example, and use that as a prayer, as a form of praising for God. Another one that can be kind of fun is alphabet praise. Anybody ever try this? You take the letters of the alphabet and find a word beginning with each letter with which to praise God. This can be done about God's characteristics or a, a name of God found in Scripture for each of the 26 letters of the alphabet. Or it might be a little easier if you want to try this, something that begins with each letter for which you are thankful to God. You start having fun when you get to Q and X, but, you know, there's ways to be creative. To undertake an exercise like this draws us away from whatever is hopeless and f helps us focus on the presence of the One who gives us hope. Worship God for who He is. Second thought is that you can place your hope in God by trusting in His character. Verses 4 and 5 of Psalm 33 remind us that God's Word holds true, that we can trust everything He does, that He loves whatever is just and good, and that His unfailing love, His covenant faithfulness, His chesed, fills the earth. Others may let you down, but the Lord will never let you down. His unfailing love, His covenant faithfulness, endures forever. There's many Bible passages that focus on the character of God. If you need help with those, make note on the online connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and I'll be glad to get you hooked up. So trust in God's character. Third, you can marvel at God's creativity. Beginning in verse 6, Psalm 33 says that the Lord spoke the heavens into being, that He breathed the stars into existence and gave the sea its boundaries. Marveling at the created order of God can be done as simply as getting out of the house, going for a walk somewhere. Some of you have better neighborhoods to encourage this than others. It can even happen by having a Zoom chat with friends who are all different in appearance and in personality. It can remind you of the creativity of God. Fourth, you can expect God's protection. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you know that you will receive His care and protection. And verses 16 and 17 of Psalm 33 remind us that military might is not enough to protect us. Verse 18 says that the Lord watches over those who fear Him and those who rely on His unfailing love. That's not about terror, but it's about respect, about worship, about understanding God as wholly other. And it's about believing that the love with which He loved Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Deborah and Ruth and all the saints of the Old Testament is the same love with which He loves you right now. Accept that love and expect God's protection. It's what it means to place your hope in God. And finally, we place our hope in God by experiencing God's faithful love. It's not just about believing, but experiencing God's love. And how do we experience that? We experience God's love in Jesus who's coming and coming again we await, even today. Why do people say that Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year? I think it's because even if they aren't followers of Jesus, they find the season a time of hope, even if they don't understand it. They see hope in others, and they want a taste of that for themselves. We have people here, people watching, who, who are in different places, spiritually speaking. People who are in long-standing personal relationships with the Lord, who delight in this season uh, because of the hope that we have in Jesus, who died and rose again to save us, and who ascended into heaven, at the, sits at the right hand of the Father, even right now, and prays for us. There's people who grew up in the church, but 
never really embraced Jesus as Lord and Savior. They've maybe got the memory, but they don't have present experience of hope, and they want more. And there's also people who merely tolerate the spiritual aspect of the season because they know it means economic stimulation and the potential to receive a bunch of loot on Christmas morning, and that's what they place their hope in. I'm not sure where you are, but listen to this. Unless you place your hope in Jesus Christ, your hope will be short-lived, shaky, and tenuous at best. Something will happen, and you will be disappointed. Think back a few months, if you've been tracking with us for a while, to when we were looking at the first part of Romans chapter 5, because part of it speaks to this. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. This hope, this hope we have in the coming newborn King will not lead to disappointment. If you've got a Bible open wherever you are this morning and you're following along, in that Romans chapter 5 verse, I just want you to underline the word that He will not lead you to disappointment. Placing your hope in a person for emotional stability could lead to disappointment. Placing your hope in your wealth alone could lead to disappointment. But placing your hope in Jesus will not lead to disappointment. Psalm 33 verses 21 and 22 says, In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in You alone. Is your hope in God alone this morning? Sure, you can and you should have loving, supportive relationships. You can and should have savings that will help you in the future. But you can't place your hope in these things. Place your hope in the one who will not disappoint, the one who promised a Savior and provided it in His own Son. So what will you do in response? What's your next step? i got a few suggestions for you. First, you can place your hope in God alone through Jesus. Any other place you lean your ladder is going to be iffy and unreliable at best. If you're placing your hope in a person to soothe your emotions, you could be disappointed. If you're placing your hope in a big retirement fund, you could be disappointed. But if you place your hope in God alone through Jesus, you can go to the online connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca and simply tick that box that says, I want to be in personal relationship with Jesus. And I'll follow up with you and help you make the most of how this will encourage you. Another step you can take is to tell another person where hope is to be found. Maybe you have a friend who lives like a pauper because he plans to retire at 50 and, when, and his money is, you know, in high-risk stocks that could tumble. Maybe you have a loved one who insists that if she just finds the right guy, all her problems will be solved. Or uh, if she just has a baby, that someone will finally love her unconditionally. Tell these folks in love that true hope is found in God alone through Jesus. He already loves us unconditionally, no matter how much money we have, no matter what our relationship status is. So give your friends the greatest gift of all this Christmas, a hope that is in Jesus. Finally, one more step that you can take is to memorize Psalm 33, verse 22. It's not a long verse. Why don't you say this with me? Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. You can commit, to me commit that to memory. R write it down. F I find the best way to memorize stuff 
is, is to write it down and put it in places where you're going to see it most. So, uh, the refrigerator, or the bathroom, or your dresser mirror, or wherever you frequent, you know, whatever it takes. Just write that down and then say it to yourself. You can kind of create a little breath prayer out of that. And it becomes a means of encouraging you in the hope that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope is like a ladder we place against a wall. We trust it to support our dreams, our security, our future. So where are you going to place your ladder? Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Let's pray. Our hope is in you alone, Lord. Grant that this will be a statement each of us can say with confidence. Because you have given us this promise. We pray for others and even ourselves when we try to place our hope in something other than you. We pray for those whose emotional state is such that they cannot raise their eyes to look for hope in you. Use us, your servants, to speak words of hope into their lives, to show them the way that brings our hope to fruition in Jesus Christ. Empower us with your Holy Spirit so that we will be able to witness to the hope we have in your Son. We ask this through his powerful name. Amen. We'd love to keep in touch with you online, so feel free to go to that connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and uh, you can ask questions, you can uh, offer prayer requests that we can help you out with, anything that we can do to encourage you, uh, please feel free to use that method, and perhaps the comment section on YouTube may be working, or on Facebook, you can uh, use whatever you need to use, and we will definitely follow up with you.